much for having me. I felt so welcome since I got here last night. It's been really, really wonderful. So I want to thank Brooks and also you for having me and everyone for coming. It's really nice to see such a turnout. Um, so before I get started with reading, I thought that I would talk a little bit about surrealism, right? We talk about experimental writing and weird writing a lot. So I wanted to just delve into that a little. Uh, before I get started, how many of you are writers? Okay, that's pretty solid. How many of you like to read weird stuff? <laughs> okay. Um, I think we have this kind of interesting moment in the culture when we look at um, movies, uh, TV shows, right? We have like Black Mirror, we have all these kind of weird things happening culturally, but I want to talk a little bit about what that means for writing. So first let's talk about what is surrealism, right? So basically my favorite definition of this, and Brooks kind of got to this, it's this juxtaposition of two images that seem like they don't belong together at first, right? So you've got here this lobster telephone, right? Like why would a lobster be on a telephone? How, what do you feel like when you see that image? Does it bring up anything to you? Call for Chinese food. <laughs> well, I was not expecting that one. Call for Chinese food. <laughs> Anyone else? I think it gives me this sense of danger, right? Because if you go to pick up this receiver, you've got this kind of lobster claw at your ear, right? You've got this delicate ear with this very sharp thing right next to it. It kind of indicates danger. Um, it doesn't feel very good. Um, so the other part of surrealism is this, the principles, ideals, and practice of producing the fantastic in art or in literature. Um, and that's through this juxtaposition of imagery. And throughout surrealism at the start, so we're going to go back to like 1920s, right? And I'm sure you're going to recognize a few of the folks I'm going to talk about. We had Salvador Dali, we had Marcel Duchamp, we had Andre Breton, Magritte, Ernst. Do any of these names sound familiar to you? You know about that Drupi clock? situation, right? And so these were kind of the macho players of surrealism. And what they did was they really captured the essence of it by writing manifestos, by creating it in their work. Um, and so their faces should look pretty familiar because they're the people we chose to kind of elevate. Um, so what do they believe? Uh, Breton was the one who really captured everything in writing, um, which is that surrealism is effectively two distant realities brought together to create a new and uncanny union, right? And that is at its heart to me the definition of kind of what we're getting at and back then they were really trying to get into the subconscious mind in order to create this work they were trying to get past the idea of like let me paint this perfect portrait of a lady sitting on a couch although that portrait outside is wonderful and i really like it it's very floral it's like really it's really cool um but they were trying to go past that and at the time this was really radical because everyone else was doing this very traditional work um, so what did they create? Obviously, you've got the urinal with the signature on it, right? Everybody knows this one. Um, they were creating collage where they were really looking at objects put together that didn't belong together. And I'm sure you've all seen a urinal before, right? Yeah. No? <laughs> um, basically, he signed this urinal, and it was very radical at the time. Um, people were pretty ticked off about it. I actually, they have it at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, so I spent a lot of time with that urinal, which saying that out loud sounds pretty <laughs> <laughs> disgusting. I got actually mad because I went to see it one day, and it turns out they rotate it out with like a fake one so they can restore the original, and you never know if you saw the real urinal or not. So we'll see. <laughs> uh, but the problem here, and this is what, what I'll get to now, is that in the 1920s, this was largely a male-dominated movement, right? We had a lot of white dudes who were doing this. Um, and so the surrealist groups, while they did encourage diversity and they were opposed to racism and they were opposed to anything that would hold other people down, um, women were largely the colleagues and the spouses and the muses of the men of this movement. Um, and you know, for people of color, that's a little complicated too, because at the start, although they were opposed to racism, um, and they did embrace thinkers from every nation, they also weren't elevating these works to a status where like, they were captured in the history books. Um, and there's a lot of work being done right now to kind of go back in time and find these artists who were really overlooked at the time. Uh, because there were people from Cuba, from Haiti, that were making this work, um, but they weren't who we ended up remembering in a large way when we first started. Um, so let's talk about why this ring might matter. Has anybody, has anyone seen this one before, other than today? I love this ring very much. So this is Merit Oppenheim, and she was one of the leading female surrealists um, in the 1930s. 
she created that ring. It's called the sugar ring, and it's basically a take on a wedding ring. And every time the sugar cube dissolves, you replace it with a new one. <laughs> and I really liked it because I was like, that sounds like a relationship. <laughs> um, but, she, <laughs> um, but she was one of the leading female members that we do remember. And she was really holding her own among all these kind of macho men, right? Um, and this is what I love about her work. She's a master of juxtaposition, but you can see the femininity in her work, right? Here we have this elaborately framed, what appears to be sort of a nipple. We have like high heels turned into a turkey, which is this commentary on like a woman having to cook for a man and having to wear heels, right? This is killer, right? I love it. These heel turkey, I'm like, I can look at this all day long. Um, the feet of a bird as holding up a table, right? So I, I love Merritt's work, not only because she was one of the only women who were, was making a living at that time on this work, but also because she just like, she really gets me. She's very simple and stark, and she's just like exploring femininity, life, death, um, the role of a woman in a house. Like she's just trying to destroy all of that. So I love her. Um, and so there are a few other women in surrealism. Dorothy Tanning, Leonora Carrington, Frida obviously is a big one. But here's where the problem is. Brayton and Ernst, they were all kind of running around telling people they were surrealists. And Frida was like, I am not a surrealist. Like, I don't need a white man showing up telling me I'm surrealist. She completely was like, get out of my face with this. You know, and I, I think that's, I always find that kind of fascinating that she rejected the label because it was so associated with men and with Paris and with money. Um, but I would say, like, obviously looking back on it, her work clearly is surreal. It is a, a juxtaposition of images in order to get after a social ideal. Um, but what's even more interesting is Dorothy Tanning and Leonore Carrington, both of them at some point were romantically involved with Max Ernst and he, like, ruined their lives. So. Um, anyway, moving on, <laughs> how does that get us to the written word, right? Because it's like, here's all this visual art. What does that mean for writing? So let's take a quick look. In literature, this is defined as the artistic attempt to bridge reality and imagination together, right? And so the surrealist writers, and it did begin as a writing movement, they did see it at first that way, and then visual art sort of overtook it, so they, they moved in that direction. Um, but they are creating these bizarre stories that are full of juxtapositions. So let's look a little bit at kind of what those techniques look like. So here they had automatic writing. This is where you would just sit down and write everything that popped into your head down. You would not limit yourself, you wouldn't try to stop yourself, you would just go for it. Um, then you have the exquisite corpse. People would pass around um, a folded written sheet of paper and add words in order to create something absurd together. You also had the narrative of dreams. So you'd have folks who would take, go under hypnosis or go to sleep or take drugs or alcohol and then write. I would not recommend the last one because you should just write regularly. Like, I don't, I don't know if you need to start messing around with that. Um, but this is kind of what they do. And so when we talk about surrealism in writing, now we're talking about today. So how does that get us here? What's really happening is that a lot of important surrealist works by women and people of color from the past and now are really coming back into the fold. So Leonora Carrington, who is largely known as a surrealist painter, they've gone back and found all these short stories she's written, they've been republished, and they're gorgeous, they're incredible. Um, we also have Friday Black, so this is a student of George Saunders, just came out, um, I think last year, and has been nominated for quite a few awards. This is a very surrealist, sort of black mirror look at race, class, all sorts of things like this. Um, I would also say Amelia Gray wrote a book, short stories called Gutshot, um, was nominated for the Penn Faulkner, uh, very similar. You have all these sorts of strange things happening in the stories, and we're going to take a closer look at all of these in just a second, so just bear with me. Um, what it means when a man falls from the sky, this is another beautiful book, um, and Mouthful of Birds, Samantha Schweblin, a writer from Argentina, um, she's really, really incredible. And then I would say Carmen Marie Machado's Her Body and Other Parties. Um, that's another really big one that's moving toward the fantastic, toward the surreal. And so I just wanted to call out these kind of works that are coming out now that I think are really a callback to what started in the 1920s, but they're remixed, they're refreshed, they're dealing with modern issues of today. Uh, so that's what makes me really excited about them and really excited to be alive at the same time. Um, and I wanted to give you a quick preview, like what happens in these works? Why am I talking about them? So Leonore Carrington, one of my favorite stories, 
a girl has to go to a debutante ball and she doesn't feel like it, so she sends a hyena in her gown to the ball. And, the, and of course, like there's this a monster wearing a pink dress, just kind of like rolling around among high society. It's fantastic. Um, or a theme park that allows white people to play out simulations of races, fantasies, right? That, it is a very intense story, it's very heavy, but here again, a juxtaposition, right? A theme park and racism both being explored at the same time. This is intense, right? Um, it doesn't, it's almost uncomfortable. Um, so these stories, I think, are really displacing the reader and putting us into a new place where we have to face these issues that otherwise we might shut down. And I'll get to that a little bit more in a second, but I'm just excited. Um, the, another story, um, Arama. This is a woman who cannot have children, and so she weaves one out of her own hair. This is painstaking, right? If you think about the idea of someone who's so desperate for a child that they create it from anything they can find. Um, Samantha Schweblin, this one is killer. A group of women are abandoned at a gas station after being married. The husband's like, pull away. So you've got these brides just kind of in this abandoned gas station, and their dresses freaking out. Pretty good if you're out there, and you're a woman, and you're like, what? Read that one. That's awesome. Um, and then also Carmen Ray Machado, right? A pandemic overtakes the world where women become invisible. Uh, that one almost hits too close to home, right? Um, so I also want to talk a little bit about what makes these works effective, and I think a lot of it is the sentences. Uh, but all of them are really good at establishing the tone of their pieces through simple, stark sentences, right? This, this is... Um, a way in which we're forcing surrealism to become real because we just approach it as fact. And so for anyone who's attempting to write this way, one way to get there is to just assume the surreal is real and carry it all the way through to its logical end. Um, they also set a tone where the surreal thing is unquestionably reality. So how many of you have seen Black Mirror or Twilight Zone? Right. Once, once those shows start with an idea, they have to follow their logical path. And so surrealism, when I talk to classes and people who want to write or want to understand it better, one way to think about it is creating that first sentence and then just carrying it all the way through and not being afraid of what happens. And that's another way to kind of unlock the subconscious mind. Um, so yeah, I think here, as we look at like the more modern works that are addressing issues of inequality, gender, sexual identity, loss, race, all of this is being done in a strange world that allows us to displace the reader. And I think what that achieves is it allows us to talk about these issues without pointing a finger, right? If you create a new world in which we can explore these issues, um, you might bring people to the table because they don't feel like it's our world. They feel like it's some other world, just a couple clicks over. And so maybe it opens up their eyes a little bit and gives them a little bit more room to understand what you're trying to get at. So I wondered if you had any questions or you wanted to talk about what I just said a little before I do a reading. Yeah. So what exactly inspired you to get into this surreal world? Like what really stuck you in there? Yeah, uh, you know, that's a great question. When I got to uh, my MFA, I was writing very weird stories, and every time we did a workshop, someone was like, this is too weird. We don't know what you're doing. And I, everyone else was writing, like, historical fiction or romantic fiction, like, the, the like, commercial romances where, like, the man saves the woman. And I was showing up with these stories about, like, dead koalas washing up on the beach. And I felt like... A really weird and I did not feel like I belonged. I, I graduated from my master's and I thought I'm not ever going to write again, I'm done. Um, but I was lucky, I had one professor who saw what I was doing and he started to give me extra reading. He was like, well here is Donald Barclay, here is Ben Marcus, here are all these people that are actually doing like what you're trying to do. And I think that changed everything for me because it made me realize that everyone isn't writing this perfect, crisp story of literature. There are some people who are writing experimental, messy, strange, and are like open to that, you know? And I, I think there is something to be said for the fact that in, in visual art, we totally understand why a painter gets messy on the canvas or creates a weird sculpture. There's all this freedom, but we're very rigid about language. We're very rigid about what is a story, what is not a story. And I just wish we would play a little more. You know, because I do see people come into programs and get so serious that it takes away that kind of joy of, what if I just threw some blue over here? What if I, what if I tried that? You know, and I, I try to really encourage people, I have like a ton of exercises around this, because I think 
that's kind of boring. That's kind of making everyone sound the same when instead you should sound like yourself and you should like give yourself room to sort of mess around a little and get it wrong and get it right again, you know? I don't know if that answers your question, but <laughs> once I got into the experimentals, I just kept going. And then I got all these literary journals who were publishing very strange work. Um, K Train was around and Diagram and all these places that were really <coughs> celebrating um, experimental work. Yeah. Cool. So this was kind of my lead up to read to you from the Book of X. So I had applied for a bunch of writing residencies in America and I got waitlisted on all of them. And then I got a residency in Iceland, and I said, I'm going to go there and write a book. And my parents were like, just do not do that. <laughs> but I was like, I'm going. <laughs> so I went to Iceland by myself for 30 days, and I wrote a book. And then I edited it for like five years to put a long time to edit, um, because it's mostly fragments. And it's a story about a girl who is born in the shape of a knot. And this was super inspired by a sculpture by Louise Bourgeois, um, which is a knotted woman. And she kind of hangs there, and she's all twisted up. Um, so basically, when I was in Iceland, no one was there with me, so I just wrote it. Um, and it kind of explores issues of capitalism, the female body, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to read it for a little bit, and then maybe we can look at it. I don't know if that's okay. I was born and not like my mother and her mother before her. Picture three women with their torsos twisted like thick pieces of rope with a single hitch in the center. The doctors had the same reaction each birth. They lifted our slick, warped bodies into the air and stared, horrified. All three of us wailed, strange new animals, our lineage gnarled, aching, hardened. Outside, beyond the bright white lights of the hospital, the machine of the world kept grinding on, a metal mouth baring its teeth, a maw waiting to clench down on us. I'm not religious, but I damn well prayed, my mother says, exhaling smoke over the kitchen table. I rub the rosaries raw that you would take after your father. My mother's knot rests against the kitchen table, and in my tender moments, I want to reach a hand out and place it there. But as soon as you crowned, I knew it, my mother says. I could feel you or not. When my mother tells this story, I take long sips of my lemonade to keep quiet. I know she screamed the whole birth. I brought her the same pain she brought her mother. Your father says I went possessed. My eyes roll back into my head. There are 4,500 different types of knots. There are 3,800 basic variations of these knots. There are an infinite number of ways to combine these knots and their variations, and in this way, knots are like stars. We could have been complicated, figure eights, clove hitches, sheet bends, reefs, heaving lines, but our knots are simple, overhand. Our abdomens twist in and out just once. Our bodies wrapping back into themselves creating dark caverns, women coiled as snakes. <coughs> in old black and white photographs, my young mother poses next to my grandmother. Both conceal their knots beneath billowing blouses, standing stiffly on a gray lawn, their gray lips strained into gray smiles over gray teeth. My mother and I keep the home on the weekends. My mother is like the weather in that she changes daily, and each day I make a report of her. Today, my mother is focused and sharp, training me to clean. Everything must be white, pristine, diamond. Specks of dirt taunt my mother. A bucket of lemons rests at my feet. To keep a home, a woman must have hands and skin of citrus. Now do it how I do it, my mother says. You're old enough for a knife now. And I have seen it, her back hunched over the sink, the brown of her hair glinting in the sunlight, the fat of her upper arms warbling, the sawling, then the halves between her fingers, yellow moons in her palms, rubbing the lemon over the white wall. I hunch over the silver gut of the sink. I cut the lemons down the center one by one, arms shivering against the knife, separating small citrine hearts. I run the yellow halves over the white walls until they glisten, until the house chimes with the flesh of the fruit until the juice of the citrus runs into the gutters of my gnawed nail beds and then stings. My mother sits next to me on wicker furniture. We have finished our cleaning for the day and now it is magazine time. My mother's magazines are bright portals to new worlds. Women wear fantastic clothing, their faces dazzling up from the pages. My mother reads me this season's new tips. Women need whiter teeth, she says. Another trend is plastic fingernails. 
would you look at these? On the page in her lap, a pair of slender hands holds a glass of soda with a straw. The hands have long, bright red nails, shining, luscious, more perfect than anything I have ever seen before. I look at my mother's hands, their nails, which are short, unpainted, best for cleaning. The sun begins with a fat drop into the horizon. A thin sadness leaks from my heart for her. One day we'll have white teeth and red nails too, I say, and then I invent us like that in my mind. Our teeth gleaming, our nails red. I picture us beautiful and unknotted. Later in my bedroom, I shed my clothes and take inventory of my body in the long mirror. I am thin at the arms and legs, wiry brown hair down to my shoulders. My jaw is large, my ears are too big. My breasts are small and there is a bit of flatness before it begins just below my ribs where the skin changes. My knot is strained and stretch marked, shining and hard. I used to gasp when I saw it, but now it is my familiar. I have seen my mother's too when she is changing through the crack in the door. Her breasts sag over her knot and we are different in that way. The cool air pushes in through the window and rushes over that secret skin, a relief in that touch. Weekdays I go to school. I walk a mile. The school is green with a pitched roof. Most days no one minds me and I stay quiet to keep it that way. I keep track of the facts though. In my classes, I learn about the human body and history and the human brain, deep seas, jungles, islands, and the distant cities beyond our town and the distant planets beyond our world. An octopus has three hearts, nine brains, and blue blood. Female lions do 90% of the hunting for their pride. The heart of the blue whale is so large that a human can swim through its arteries. One square centimeter of skin contains roughly 100 pain sensors. The sun will only get brighter before it collapses. I'm gonna stop there and we can talk about it. There's a generational like chain of like poor self-image. Does she ever overcome that? She love her not? Uh, I don't want to spoil it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when I was thinking about the female body, I wanted to create something that could stand in for like anxiety, depression, body images, and I didn't want to like make it about a woman who just was struggling with her body. I wanted it to be something that was like handed down. Because I was thinking a lot about like what are we born with and like how can we overcome it? Like what's the limitation? Um, and so yeah, it is generational and she does kind of look back at the women who came before her and she tries to kind of become part of society despite that. Yeah. I mean if that's the only question I can ask myself in part of do you think that would be cool if I was like <laughs> One of her surreal, and, and you're talking about weird and strange, and this kind of duped me into thinking this could really possibly happen. Uh, it, it was a lot cleaner, less weird than I thought. Well, I cut some of the weirdness out, so. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, I, I was trying to write a book that you couldn't place in a certain time. And so a lot of the things that happen, like the jobs that people work um, and the way that money is handled, like they transact in gold coins, um, a lot of it was trying to write around space. So the um, father and the brother work in a meat quarry that's on their land where they harvest meat and they sell it in town, um, which is very like visceral and kind of gross and bloody. So I tend to not always read from that part. Um, but basically that was a way to talk about labor and rural America without having to get like, oh, they were corn farmers or, you know, because then all of a sudden you're talking about the machinery and the time and the place. And, you know, so part of surrealism for me is trying to talk about these issues without um, going into like historical fiction or going into a place, you know, they're cleaning the walls with lemons because if I say the word bleach, you're going to see the bald guy, you're going to see an aisle in the grocery store, you're going to smell it, right? Like all of a sudden now I've given you like a time and a place. And so um, a lot of the surrealism is kind of a way to get around that. I guess on the Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned that you worked on, on the book um, in a 30-day mm -hmm. um, sort of experience in Ireland that edited it over a long time. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between your process as you wrote it? Yeah. 
Yeah, so with tiny small correction, I was in Iceland. The only reason I say that is because the landscape was very surreal there. Um, I was going to like black beaches where the water was white and the sand was black and there were like silver fishes all over them. It was crazy. And there was always like a rainbow on the ground. It was just it was just a magical place to be. You know, every day I woke up and something crazy happened. And I was like, nature is wild. Um, and so yeah, I wrote 70,000 words while I was there. Um, and then I work full time, which is something else I talk about a lot. I think having a full time job that allows me to write fiction that I think is a little bit weirder because I'm not searching for like a six figure book deal. I'm not, you know, I'm able to make the work I want to. Um, but when I came back, I sent the first draft of the book to five agents and they said like, this is beautiful, but it's too tragic. We cannot sell this. Um, because it's it's not a happy book. It's very much dealing with issues of the body and issues of like being a woman that has a job and is being overlooked. I mean, she eventually moves to a city and tries to fit in and tries to become like a member of the world. And she's constantly kind of pushed back against, and I wouldn't say bullied, but I mean, it's hard for her. She's a tragic character. You know, I always I always can like think about Edward Scissorhands when I think about her, right? Because Edward Scissorhands, they let him come to the town for a while, but he's got to go. Like, he can't, you know, and we see this trope. We see this trope throughout all sorts of movies and books, like Frankenstein, you know, E.T., right? Everybody eventually has to go back to where they came from, and she is, you know, no exception. But the agents were like, this is crazy and way too sad. Um, and then Two Dollar Radio accepted it, so you know, I, I edited for probably five years, and I think I took a lot of the trauma out. And people read the book now, and they're like, this was darker? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah um, but I, I do think, you know, there, it's worth discussing, like, trauma and what we were raised with and kind of how we operate in the world um, and the way in which we treat each other without knowing how much we're all carrying, right? Like, you meet someone in the grocery store who, like, cuts you off with their cart, and you just assume the worst of them, but, like, maybe they're going through something you can't even see. And so I think the book is dealing with a lot of that, too. Yeah. Uh, in what ways are you and the girl in the book <laughs> That's a good question. Um, you know, I think sometimes, like on certain pages, I'm like, oh, I'm her. If you <laughs> if you picked one page, and I could say that's me. But then there are other pages where it's not me at all. You know, she um, she goes through a lot worse than I do. And I think as a character, when I started to write her, I knew she was going to be tragic. I knew she was going to have a hard time. Um, I think some of the stuff that is similar is, you know, working a job and like being a woman and getting talked to a certain way or getting yelled at on the street. Like there are certain things that definitely carry over. You know, she struggles with like her body and how she looks and trying to have relationships. And it, so I think there's a lot in here that's actually universal. Um, and, you know, she is kind of looking at capitalism. Like, why do I have to wake up every day and go to work? That's not natural. You know, it's because it's, and, and there's part of me that's like, yeah, girl, it sucks. <laughs> um, not to like be a downer, but, um, so yeah, she's, she's confronting a lot of that stuff. And I think that part, yeah, for sure. But there's other parts that are certainly not me, you know, yeah. Yeah. When you were in Iceland, what inspired you the most to write? Um, you know, I think, so being a working writer, there's a lot of advice that comes from back in the day that's like, just put your ass in the chair every day and write every day. But I would say we're at a point in capitalism where people are working, you know, multiple jobs to get by or they're working full time. And so that's a lot harder to do now. Like we're working longer hours than we ever have. Um, and so, you know, having just a month to go write was like, insane to me, you know? I'm usually working a stressful job, and so I usually write short stories, because that's the easiest thing for me to do in my free time. Um, but to wake up every day and just go back to the same book and be able to work on it was incredible. And then also, obviously, like the landscape. Just, I saw the Northern Lights, and that really inspired the end of the book, for sure. Um, so yeah. Iceland actually gave me a lot. It was also, I hate to say it, it was awesome to leave America, because I think it was right after, I, I want to believe it was right after Trump was elected, and I was just like, it, it was a luxury and a privilege to be able to step back from all this noise and just go make something and be able to look back at America with like this different view, you know, because I, I was at a different time zone, I wasn't seeing all these Twitter hot takes, people weren't trying to fight with me on the internet, you know, I couldn't see CNN, um, so there was a way in which like leaving America was actually super helpful too. If it had been, say, Hawaii instead of Iceland, do you think you would have 
situation is basically the same? Uh, you know, I don't think so. There's something kind of cold and also magical about Iceland. It's kind of a brutal landscape. There's not a lot of crops that grow there. Um, you know, it's kind of a hard place. Uh, but I actually think I'm going to go the other way next time. Like, I'm like, I feel like I want to go to a jungle. <laughs> like, what happens if I go to a jungle and write a book, you know? Um, but yeah, I do kind of plan to go somewhere that looks a little different and see what happens. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things about surrealism that is powerful is, as you put the, the lobster in the funnel and you're asking everyone what do they see and whatnot, it, it is very particular, particularizing. It, it really gets you to dig into yourself and find these weird spaces and these weird things. And I, I thought it was interesting, though, that you keep talking about your surrealism and the book as being universal. Is it universalizing, or how do you how do you deal with that? You know, this is so weird. It can only be interpreted through my own subconscious. Yeah. Versus, I'm trying to tell a story to everyone who's a woman, who's yeah. capitalism, who's you know, body image. Yeah. That's a really good question. I think one of the things that is most effective for me is making sure that there's a human emotion involved. Right? Like, the book and the story can be as surreal and weird as you want, but you need to be grappling with life, death, money, the body. These things are like, everybody is dealing with them. And so I think the way, certainly I think the book does speak a lot to women and what they go through, but I do think the other parts of it that are universal are dealing with like the money, um, life and death, right? Like, these are things that we're all dealing with all the time. And so in some ways we're not separate. You know, she has a lot of pain and a lot of struggles and she comes from a family that's been through a lot. And I don't think that that is gendered. I think that's probably true of most of us, you know. I don't know a lot of people that's not true of, because they're not modern. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> um, it, you know, I think, I think as long as we're using surrealism to interact with these bigger issues, then it becomes much more um, appealing to more than just, you know, women who are dealing with that kind of thing. I don't know if that answers the question. Somebody else? Oh, yeah. Do you ever like experience writing Um, You know, I think it's different for me. Some people write every single day. I pretty much only write when I have a good idea. Um, and I, you know, I'll get a sentence and I'll know I need to stop reviewing and just like get out of draft. <laughs> Bless you. Um, but, you know, I, I do go through periods. I mean, especially after you put a book out, you just kind of get exhausted. You know, um, there's a part of writing that is very interior and private. I feel like I had this book. It was mine for four or five years. Now everyone else can have it. So it's like now I have to go out and like stand next to it and tell people about it. So this isn't like a time where I'm like really writing a lot. You know, I'm writing some short stories and essays and interviews. But, um, I don't know what's happening? I was looking for a name, but I found it. Many of people, this woman with the knot, makes me think of people like Stephen Hawking. And the man who's bombed your arms or legs who became a motivational speaker. And I wonder, maybe in each of our lives there's something that's surreal. And this is not so bizarre as it might seem. Exactly, yeah. And I think it does get to, she goes through a lot of pain and she goes to like a lot of doctors and tries to figure out what's wrong with her. So yeah, there is a whole kind of method of that too. Yeah. Oh yeah, hold on. Can somebody back there have a hand up? I wanted to get to you. You actually answered it. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so, cool. Yeah. Uh, do you think that, like, Rachel Roosevelt, does, like, her pain comes from her body and from capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. uh, did you put me clear on the book? Is um, relation or yeah, because she still goes. she still has to go to work, mm -hmm. right? She still has to like get up every day and earn money, right? There's really no stopping for her. She just like goes to the doctor on the day off, you know. So there is this kind of tension between how do I function in capitalism and how do I take care of myself? Um, and so yeah, I think that's very much involved. Yeah. yeah. What was your uh, yeah, you know, actually, I just like went into a very manic state. I think something happens where when you know a book's going to get published that you just like freak out. And I did not talk to anyone. I was like locked in my room. I was like editing. I was working still, so I was editing every night. And 
um, I just really looked at every sentence and thought, like, what would my favorite writer be doing right now? How would they be editing it? And I pretty much went that direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's crossed my mind. I think now it's a little bit more of an option, like it's on the table, but I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know what the impact would be on my work yet. So we're gonna see what that looks like. Yeah. Have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Um, thanks, Sarah.